morning, my name is Kim. I'm Jen. And we are your favorite occupational therapists. Today we will be talking to you about temper tantrums and primarily meltdowns. Um, you see temper tantrums in almost all toddlers, all preschoolers, and you can tell the difference between a temper tantrum and a meltdown because a temper tantrum is when a child is angry, they didn't get their way, or they want something, and they're trying to manipulate their parent. Um, as soon as you can tell that it's a temper tantrum because as soon as they get what they want, magically the crocodile tears have gone away. Sometimes they get a little smile of happiness on their face. Um, and during the temper tantrum, you can often see them looking out of their corner of their eye at you because they want you to watch them. When they're having a meltdown, none of that is true. It is out of their control. They are not trying to change your behavior whatsoever. They are usually very overwhelmed at either what's happening in their environment, if they're hypersensitive to sounds, to touch, to sights, if there was a transition that they weren't prepared for, um, if they aren't feeling well, if their stomach hurts them but they can't tell you, if they wanna communicate something with you but they can't communicate because a lot of our kids with sensory processing disorder or autism are delayed with their speech, all of those things can lead to a meltdown. And so we're going to talk about the five stages of a meltdown right now. Yes, we are. We're going to show you the five stages of a meltdown. Number one, your child is calm and content and happy. And in the OT world, we'll call that the green light state or the calm alert state. Everything is going well. Stage two, there is some trigger, and you may not know what that is right now, but as you start to think about meltdowns with your child, you're going to want to be a detective. We've talked about that, or a super sleuth, where you try and figure out what the trigger was before there's a meltdown, because 100% of the time, there is a trigger. Again, if you haven't worked with an occupational therapist, you can get one in an early intervention program in your state. Early intervention is for children under the age of three, or you can find an occupational therapist in an outpatient clinic that can do some sensory testing to find out if your child is hypersensitive to sounds, to sights, to touch, to movement, to anything in the eight sensory systems, um, or transitions, or is it the way their stomach is feeling? But there is a trigger, and we want you to spend some time trying to figure out what that is. The next thing will be subtle and not so subtle signs of distress. The trigger has bothered them, and they're either beginning to vocalize differently. If they don't say words, the vocalizations might be different. They might start hand flapping. They might start pacing. They may, may start hitting themselves. They may get angry. They may hit others. I've had some kids who were calm and then all of a sudden picked something up and threw it. So they're showing you some signs of distress. In stages two and three, that's when you can make the biggest changes. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Stage four is the meltdown. That child is no longer in control and you're not really in control of what's happening with them other than your primary uh, job at that stage is to keep them safe. And we'll talk about that. And stage five is regrouping. So now we're gonna go back and start in number one, calm. And calm has two components. If you know that you have to give your child a transition, if you know you have to take them to the doctor, or you're taking them to a restaurant, or you're taking them to the grocery store, there might be things that you can do to really induce a state of calm with them if you know that those activities are gonna upset them. And Jen is gonna talk about some of those things that you can do before you take them to a trigger state. Yep. So what we want to do is give you a big bag of trip, tricks. We want to make sure that you have a lot of strategies so that when your child is going to have a meltdown or is in distress, we can get them out of it before a meltdown. That's, I guess, what I really want you to do is to preempt the meltdown. So we're going to go through the sensory systems and we're going to give you a variety of ideas and every child is different, so you have to figure out what works for your child, and also every day is different. So what works today might not work tomorrow. So let's start with the vision system. Um, some ideas for the vision system, I have a sensory bottle here that I made, and this is a super simple one out of a plastic bottle, just in case they do chuck it. I've got some blue color, uh, coloring, food coloring in there, 
and some sparkles. I didn't add glycerin. Um, there are some other recipes out there, but this is really just to help them calm. You can use lava lamps. Sometimes kids like fish tanks. Um, they have those toys that they're kind of like this, that you turn upside down and the things float in there if you buy it commercially. Um, but you can use this to, to help calm them, but also for the vision system, but also as a transition when this, when this glitter is at the bottom, that's when it's gonna be time to leave for the store or whatever. So the vision system, do you have any more for that? Kim? I do. So transitions are all, all frequently triggers for kids. So they're enjoying what they're doing and you need them to stop to take them to the store. So we need to figure out a way to give them a warning. This is a free app on my phone and you can set this for any amount of time. I have it set for 10 seconds and I want to let them know that we're going to be going to the grocery store when this goes off. What's the name of that app, Kim? The name of that app is, but it's, it's a timer app. And that, that can pull up all kinds of things, like a choo-choo train can go round and round, but they'll get used to it after a while that when that timer goes all the way around, they know it's time to make a transition. I also like in general using picture schedules so that kids have some predictable predictability. They know what's coming in their day that can help them plan and predict. And I also like the now and next or the now and then cards. So you can take just a piece of paper and now we're playing this and next we're going to the store. So you can use pictures on your phone. You can use real pictures. You could use words if they read, um, but the now and then is something to that we can use their visual system to help help them prepare um, so that they don't have a meltdown. All right, the next system would be auditory, maybe. So that's the one we're picking. So some auditory ideas are music, some calm music, um, some headphones. We've talked about headphones in the auditory um, video, so you, maybe you can go back to the review, but the, he, the hard headphones or even the soft headphones that go on, a baseball cap um, might come down low enough to help cover the ears a little bit if the auditory system is borrowing them. Yeah, some kids like to listen to music, soft music, classical music lowers the heart rate, so I like to play music for the kids. You know, they could listen to it at home, Get, get in that relaxed state so that when you're out and about and, and maybe you're about to approach a trigger, you can play some of that music for, for them and they remember that they made them feel calm. That could be helpful to them as well. Um, the proprioceptive system is the system that I like to use the most for calming kids. So if I want to teach my child how to calm down, how to self-regulate so they eventually have tools to calm themselves down, I might teach them a few yo yoga positions like the baby pose or downward facing dog. We teach them deep breathing, the purslip breathing, the deep diaphragmatic breathing. I've taught that to kids as young as two. For kids younger than that, you can have them sit on your lap and you can do the deep breathing and they can feel that and that calms them down. Um, when you are out and about, because sometimes you just have to go to a place that is a trigger, but the proprioceptive um, toys and those proprioceptive toys are things that activate your muscles and joints are all very common. So you can take a kid and in that kid, you can have some things that they've got to chew, whether it's crunchy foods, it's chewy foods, it's taffy, um, licorice, because any kind of input into the jaw is very relaxing. You could have a juice box with a tiny little straw because the sucking is very relaxing into the jaw. Uh, it, you could also have some therapy putty where they have to do a lot of squeezing. You could have fidget toys. So any kind of proprioceptive work is calming for a child when they're out and about. So some other proprioception is um, you could do the blanket will roll or you could do a weighted blanket or you could do a weighted stuffed animal. They have the ones that go around the neck. I have a bear claw here, which is a compression vest um, for little ones. The, this part goes around their um, waist and then the straps come off and are adjustable and you can make them as tight as you need them. You can wear compression clothing, um, that might help. I have a weighted vest here that a family made um, and it's got little pockets that you could add weights. We never want to do more than 15% of their body weight when they're out and about like this. Um, if you need to turn it around so the zipper's in the back if they're taking it off. 
if they're taking it off, chances are they don't want it on, so it doesn't feel good to them. So I wouldn't push it. Um, so that is the proprioceptive system. Some ideas for the vestibular system are slow rhythmical rocking, either on a therapy ball, maybe on their belly, or on your lap in a uh, rocking chair, or maybe if you have a swing set, swinging um, in a swing set could be, but it's gotta be slow rhythmical. So it's not the fast tire swing, it's slow rhythmical. Right. And you know, the other thing that we've talked about before is counting. Repetition is very, very relaxing to kids with sensory processing disorder or autism. So when you're home and relax before they're exposed to a trigger, you can do some deep breathing with them and just do some slow rhythmical counting so that if you're at, they begin to associate that with relaxation. So if you're out and about and they're exposed to a trigger, just start some slow counting with them again and they'll associate that with relaxation. The other thing that I like to do when kids are calm and we're working on some self-regulation uh, skills is uh, social stories. Carol Gray is the one that came up with that back in the 1990s. You can find that on the internet. And social stories are a way of making, using a book or pictures of your own child where you're trying to teach them a skill. So if they want to learn about going to the grocery store and staying relaxed, you can have pictures of them in the cart, pictures of them playing with one of their fidget toys, pictures of them looking around so that you're showing them the experience of going to the grocery store where they're not getting upset. You can do a social story with any activity that you're trying to teach them, whether it's getting dressed, eating with utensils, getting in the car, going to school, but lots of pictures of them doing the activity and show them that book over and over again so they start to have a new idea of what that activity feels like. And along with that um, is kind of video modeling. Sometimes I take videos of my kids being very happy and playful and I'll show them that video like, remember, this is what we look like when we're happy and playful and calm. The only other thought I had when Kim was talking about the counting, I've actually had some success with counting when kids are in the very, very, very beginning stage of a meltdown. If I can do the counting to 10, it calms me down, it calms them down, and I've had some success with that, just slowly counting to 10. Yeah. And then actually saying, I am calm. And yeah. then I'll start all over. One two, three, all the way to 10, I am calm. If they're not quite calm, but they're getting there, I'll do it again. So I've had some success with that. Perfect. All right, um, ready to move on the oral, the oral system. So Kim has touched on that um, for the proprioception system because it was working on the strength of the jaw. But the oral sucking is also very, very calming. So sucking through a straw is good for that. A lot of our kids have pacifiers late in life. And if your child still has a pacifier, that might be helpful. Um, sucking on a lollipop or a popsicle, something like that, that might be helpful. But blowing activities are also for breath control, really, really good. Um, I love having a bag of blow toys, whistles, um, the flutophone, the, those little party favors that go out and come back in. So having a bag of blow toys for them would be very helpful and also work on that breath control and calming. Mm -hmm. You could put some fruit leather, you could put some beef jerky, crazy as it sounds, lots of kids like beef jerky and those things are very, very chewy and that's very relaxing input into the jaw. So you can have those in your little sensory kit when you go off to the store. And then the tactile system, um, I like, Kim's already talked about some of them for the proprioceptive system, but also like the koosh ball or those little stress balls or the balls that light up, which would also be part of the visual system. So sometimes it's hard not to mix sensory systems just because everything's closely related. Um, but that might help. Some of my kids like lotion, um, and especially if it's smelly lotion, we didn't really talk about the um, smell but that might be calming for them. Lavender is super calming. Um, we can, if you diffused things, if, if uh, oils were your thing, that might be calming for them. Kind of put those two systems together. Anything else, Kim? Mm -hmm. That's good. All right, so those are some tricks that you have that you can use to work on in the calming stage to help your child self-regulate 
could preempt a um, meltdown. Exactly. And, and say F number two is the trigger. Uh, if they're very young children and they haven't learned how to self-regulate, how to self-calm, you, you might want to avoid those triggers. Again, work with an occupational therapist if you need help figuring out what those triggers are. Transitions, communication frustrations, um, sounds sensitivity, sight sensitivity, tactile sensitivity, movement sensitivity, so that you can avoid those triggers while you're helping them to develop the skills for relaxing. Anything else on the triggers, Jen? Uh, no, but I did have a, another video, if I can do this, on a sack. I did not do that one. Let's see if this works. Yes. So this is a body sock. Oh, they do not want to play my body sock. Oh, I don't know why. Anyway, you can see it's a body sock. They go in there and they stretch. I have a calming spot you can see in the corner of this room. Um, she has a calming spot, a tent. It's got some pillows in there. It's got some balls in there. Um, some things that help um, them relax. And when they're in the tent, they kind of shut out the rest of the world. So that could be, you want a safe space for them to go. Right. That's another idea. Stage three is signs of distress. So you really want to notice the very, very subtle signs of distress that are starting to occur after the trigger. Um, some kids, they have vocalization changes. If they don't communicate, you just might notice their, their, their sounds get higher, the frequency of their voice gets higher. They might start hitting themselves. They might start crying. They might start hitting you. They might start throwing things. They might start pacing. Anything else we see, Jen, with signs of distress? I see a change in, the, in their breathing. Um, and sometimes they honestly, like their eyes get wide. They get kind of sweaty. Right. Yeah. And that is right before a meltdown. So if you can remove the trigger situation at that point in time, start doing some of those relaxing relaxation strategies that we talked about earlier, you might be able to ward off a meltdown. If not, you're in stage four, it is the meltdown phase. There's nothing that we can do to stop that at, at, at this time. Our job is to stay as calm as we can, which is really hard, especially if you're out in the community and people are looking at you. Ignore them as best as you can. Um, and get your child to a place where they are safe. If you're at home, hopefully you have a place like Jennifer just showed you where there's a tent that the child associates with relaxing or in their bed, but very safe. A lot of our kids like to hit their heads or hit themselves, so we wanna make sure that they're not doing that. On a few instances, I've had to order soft helmets for some of my kids who really will find bricks or something to, to try and relieve the stress by hitting themselves. So we wanna keep them as safe as we can. Sometimes we re recline right next to them. They know that you're there. You can't do anything for them, but they know that you're there. Anything and, else? And be re sorry. Mm -hmm. And be respectful that sometimes they're like, if it's their tactile system that's off, they don't want to be touched. But sometimes, uh, like kind of firm pressure or maybe sitting on your lap with a tight hug, that might be calming to them. But my other piece of advice for you is to shut your voice off, that they are already overwhelmed. They can't, when they're in that when they're in the limbic system of their brain and they're crying and they're, they can't hear, they can't think, they can't reason they can't take any information in so just let it be try to say nothing other than just offering comfort with your presence yes that is so important that is so important and then when it's over give them a big hug what they went through was very very stressful and very hard for them give them a big hug tell them you love them tell them you're glad that they're better slowly bring them back out into into the family life and watch them for a little bit because if there's a lot going on back in the living room they may need to go back in and calm down again but um just be very reassuring with them so if it was a short-lived meltdown maybe it was just a couple of seconds or maybe a couple of minutes and you think it was related to what they were working on, I would help if, it, if you think it's appropriate, help them resolve that issue. And maybe just cleaning up and being done with that toy is part of it. There's a very fine line between meltdowns and behaviors. And sometimes kids realize that if they cry just a little bit, parents will come running or family will come running. So they're gonna play us a little bit. So we wanna make sure that the, there's no crossing over of that line and they're not using us. 
um, for to, for special treatment. So if at all possible, go back to the event prior to the trigger and see if we can end that event so we can move on. And, and then on top of that, almost the reverse of what Jen is saying, sometimes a child starts with a temper tantrum, but our kids with sensory processing disorder or autism don't know how to self-soothe and self-regulate. So they become so overstimulated by the temper tantrum, it morphs into a meltdown. And you can tell the difference. They're no longer trying to change your behavior. They no longer want what they were trying to get. They are in a different state. They are not looking at you. They cannot calm themselves down. And when that occurs, you treat that just like a regular meltdown with all the strategies that we talked about earlier. So good luck creating your bag of tricks. And we hope this was helpful. If you liked it, please like and subscribe and we'd love to see your comments and we'll see you again soon. Bye.